you know, we just really felt like as a community, we've uh, got so many new people that are a part of us. We've been through so much transition that we, we hardly know who we are and we hardly know one another, hence the potluck. And we, we just, we don't know what our, our, our values are necessarily together. Uh, we don't know how the church works. We don't know how the leadership works or who the leaders are. And we just thought, man, it would just be really good for us to take a little bit of time and just, you know, this is a time when we're all gathered and to just sit down and do uh, some family business. I, I'm going to pray before we do, but I'm also just going to read a little chunk of Ephesians. Um, because when we were, uh, you know, at Calvary a couple of years ago, one of the things we felt really engaged with was this uh, a little bit of teaching on just, just what the church is and, and how important the church is. And as we, uh, you know, share a little bit about our church and, and what it's about and, and how we're sort of structured, what our values are, um, I want us to be conscious that we're participating in something really big and something that God really wants to work through uh, in the world. Um, oh, I just scrolled past it. There we are. So this is Paul talking about his calling and talking about the church and, and just sort of saying, get, get ready, I'm going to reveal, God's revealing something to the world. And he says this, he says, It was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light. So this is his purpose. He's, he's called, this is the Apostle Paul, called to preach to the Gentiles, right? And bring the gospel uh, to the whole world. And then here's his other purpose, which it seems like how like this is this is significant, right? And to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purposes that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so it's like, whatever we are as a church, and, and however we express ourselves in our region, we're part of something that is meant to uh, really reveal the wisdom and grace and beauty of God to the world. And so uh, as, as, we, as we wrestled through, you know, what it is to be a church and how we do leadership and all of these questions, we, we recognize that it's, that it's a pretty significant project. And, uh, and, and we're, our, our hope, you know, and we've made lots of mistakes and we'll continue to make lots of mistakes in it. And we don't have the answer on uh, what the church is supposed to be uh, ourselves contained within this body. But as we uh, bring all of that stuff forward, we just want to really say sort of humbly before the Lord, we, we want to come in line with your purpose and, and be a church that glorifies you and that reveals you to the world. And so let's just pray about that for a minute. Lord, we thank you for this body, this infinitesimally small uh, fragment of, of your church worldwide. Uh, we recognize that we are very small, but we also recognize the significance of what this church is meant to be to our region. And we pray in, in alignment with Ephesians uh, 3 that we would be a people who would uh, reveal the manifold wisdom of God uh, to our to our region. That somehow we would grow to a place of health, that we would be a place of stability, that we would be a place of safety, a place of worship, a place where your glory resides. That uh, when people come into this community from uh, their, their workplaces and, and wherever we intersect with them, Lord, that they would see uh, your wisdom, your grace, your beauty in us. So would you form us and would you shape us and help us to be uh, that to you and to your world, we pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. So for those of you that don't know our story, uh, OBC uh, began in 2004. Um, at that time, it was called Ottawa Valley um, Vineyard Church, and we remain a vineyard church to this day. But we began in 2004. Um, we, Anna and I, uh, as, as a couple, as pastors, we had a dream to uh, plant a church in Carlton Place that we really retained all the way through high school. Um, actually, right here in the cafetorium in, in Carlton Place High School, which was actually down the hall where the kitchens are. Now, we um, had an inter-school Christian fellowship group that we were, were a part of in this building. 
in when I had this calling experience when I was 17 years old. Uh, Craig was a part of that community, and others were a part of the community. And we um, gathered uh, almost every morning to worship before school and pray. It's where I learned, led worship for the first time. I felt like we should do worship. And I got a guitar that was about $150 and sounded terrible. And I learned three chords, and I led worship the next day. I don't know if Craig and Amber and Anna remember how bad that was, me howling it out, like down the hall, echoing. She does actually remember you know, out of tune and singing loudly and singing badly. Brent was a part of that. Um, and, and so this is actually the second iteration of church in Carlton Place High School uh, for me. So we've had this vision to, to reach the community of Carlton Place for a long time. My wife and I moved away and had ventures all over the place in New York and New Brunswick and Saskatchewan and uh, came back eventually to plant this uh, church in, in Toronto in 2004. And as we uh, planted the church and, and began, we, it was a very, very small plant in the sense that we didn't really have any funding. It wasn't like a well-funded denominational plant coming in with a $200,000 budget for our smoke machines and light show and all of that kind of stuff. That was, uh, that was not how this plant, uh, plant went. Uh, we met in a home uh, just uh, in downtown Carlton Place. Uh, probably like three couples really joined us in the beginning and we just invited our friends and invited other people to come and it sort of slowly grew from there and when we didn't fit in the home we moved over to uh, the canoe club and when we didn't fit in the canoe club we moved over here and so that's kind of been our journey just kind of growing organically as the Lord has has led us it's never had a real period of explosive growth uh, we've uh, and, and we've just had sort of moments where you know life has happened and people have ebbed in and out of the community and flowed in and out of the community. We've had good moments, we've had painful moments, and uh, and it's been that kind of uh, journey. Um, we had uh, in in terms of sort of the more recent history, um, I think possibly maybe one of the more significant moments for us uh, pre-pandemic was a leadership retreat that we had. Um, up at a up at a cottage up the valley, where we we gathered and said, okay, so here we are. We've been through ups and downs. We've been through pains. We've been through glories. We've experienced uh, some good things as a community. But but what do you want with us? Like like what do you want to change with us, Lord? And I came into that meeting thinking, okay, we need to have a building project and we need to have our five year plan established. And I came in gung ho with so many good ideas. And my team who loves me said, let's just put the brakes on that just a little bit. And that's just us sort of seeking the Lord together and, and praying. And what we felt like the Lord said to us in that meeting was that we were actually going to go on a, a little bit of a journey of having to trust the Lord day by day. And the image that he gave us uh, sort of prophetically as we prayed into that was uh, that we were going to be sort of going through a period of time in the wilderness where we were following uh, the pillar of fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day and that the Lord would sort of lead us uh, day by day and we had no idea like that was that was just maybe uh, maybe a year or something before the pandemic hit when we wouldn't have a place to meet we wouldn't know where we're meeting we wouldn't know any like you know what the pandemic did to the church like talk about wandering through the wilderness having to follow the lord day by day so without us having known the lord prepared us for a certain amount of flexibility uh, to walk through that time. During that time, we felt like the Lord wanted us to work on uh, some structural things. We felt like we needed to shift from being uh, a church that was sort of organized as a leadership community. We were kind of organized as almost like an advisory committee community where we had good leadership people sort of helping give direction to the church and that input community was part of it. And we need, But we needed to transition to be a community that was more of a true spiritual eldership where we really bear the spiritual weight of care. And so we, we've begun to learn about that. Uh, we, we've done a course uh, out of the States and just, just educating ourselves and learning what it means to be uh, a bit of a more substantially responsible uh, leadership community. We felt at that time that we were needing to learn about discipleship and grow deeper in that. Uh, certainly that's been a theme in recent months when, when the pandemic hit, we knew how shallow our discipleship was. And then the other thing that happened in the pandemic was we felt like we needed to signal to uh, the people of Carlton Place, the other churches in Carlton Place, 
uh, that we were uh, about the community, that we wanted to be uh, something that was uh, interfacing with the different spiritual communities, the body of Christ in Carlton Place. And so we laid down our denominational banner, retained the denominational association. We're still a vineyard church, but we decided we would, we would be called Ottawa Valley Community Church as a way of kind of being that first church in the community to sort of lay down our flag and say, okay, we, we want to build the church in Carlton Place. And that was our, our heart to do that. And part of what inspired our journey with Calvary, wanting to build that partnership there. And obviously you guys know the story of, of that and how how that, that didn't work out. We can talk more about that later. But uh, for us, uh, we, we still have these amazing partnerships with different churches. We run the youth program that most churches in the region participate in. Uh, churches from uh, the region also participate in our, our children's program on Wednesday nights. And we, we, we've just grown in our ability to interface with the broader body of Christ. And so here we are. We've been through this transition at Calvary. Uh, we've come back to the high school with all the flashbacks and all the logistical challenges that you guys see on a weekly basis. And, and, and in terms of the state of the union, in terms of the current moment in our story, uh, I would say that we are slowly regaining our feet, but we're still a little wobbly. Does that seem safe to say? Anybody feel still a little bit wobbly? <laughs> I, I think that's the reality as we as we've come out of that uh, that period of time with Calvary and and coming into a new place and rebuilding all of our uh, volunteer teams and and it's just I think after so much transition coming through the pandemic uh, coming through this you know merger that didn't work we came out of that kind of exhausted and tired all of the work to transition into this place and I don't know about you guys but for me I just feel like I think nothing crazy is going to happen for a short while. <laughs> I think we can we can kind of look at our structure again. We can begin to you know build up leaders. We can begin to function in a way that uh, that will allow us to just stabilize the body. And so that's why we're having this meeting is so that we can stabilize the body and and build cohesion and get to know one another and uh, explain all of that. Um, as I said before, we are a vineyard church. Um, how many of you are familiar with what the vineyard is? So, so not very many of us. It's one of the reasons that we actually uh, rebranded is because when you say to people, I'm from Ottawa Valley uh, Vineyard Church, uh, people say, vineyard, Ottawa Valley Vineyard. Like, is there a wine tasting we can attend? And why is there only wine tastings on Sunday morning? And I didn't even know you could grow grapes in Carleton Place. Um, so it just from a brand confusion thing, we thought, oh, let's just lay that down and just sound like we're a normal church for a while. But we are part of uh, the Vineyard. It is a denomination. It uh, began in California really um, in the 70s and sort of grew from there. There are Vineyard churches all around the world um, and Vineyard churches in Canada, very small in Canada. There are about 52 Vineyard churches in the nation. Uh, scattered around. I think there are 52 Pentecostal churches within 100 kilometers. So we're very, very small by comparison. But we have a national director, a guy named David Roos. How many of you met David Roos when he was here uh, in the spring? He was here to visit us. I have a regional overseer, a guy named Peter Weed. And so we're just very grateful for uh, the connection with the denomination and the supervision and the grounding and the resourcing and the oversight. We're Because vineyard churches are so few, we are a little isolated. Um, it's quite a long way away to the other vineyard church in Ottawa, and then a long way from there uh, to um, other other churches you know, in the region. The next in um, southern Ontario, and so. But you would have met uh, the pastor of the other vineyard church a couple of weeks ago, and a guy named Richard Long when he spoke here. So Richard Long and I are part of a group of vineyard pastors that sort of meet for accountability and input and prayer support. Uh, I meet with him. How many of you do? You, some of you remember Art Ray, who's visited our church a few times. Art Ray is part of that group. And have you met Larry Levy? If you've been around for a long time, Larry Levy is also part of that group. So I've got a great group of vineyard pastors who uh, get into my story and know what's going on in my guts and, you know, will poke me when I'm not paying attention and, you know, can speak into my life and, and, and are a huge blessing. And I speak into theirs as well. And so we have that. And the, and the heart for the of the vineyard is uh, to take that image from the book of John. I am the vine and you are the branches. Um, if anyone remains in me, he will bear much fruit. 
and and it's that's what it is about for us is trying to be a church that is actually deeply rooted and deeply connected to the person of Jesus through the Holy Spirit so that we can be people who uh, move in whatever he is calling us to in terms of our vocation, in terms of our connection. And so again, very, very grateful for our, our connection with the Vineyard and all of those friendships. Um, in terms of our values, um, how, how are we doing? Are, you, are we, we doing okay? <laughs> This is a bit of an unusual talk. Um, in, in terms of our in terms of our values, um, I, I think I think we're we're in a bit of a time of transition on that as well. Uh, as a as a church, when we uh, sort of came through the pandemic, and we realized sort of in some ways how shallow our roots were, and in some ways, like I think I think I've, I've shared about this. Like the challenge of the pandemic was that you know we had a body that was you know fairly significant. Uh, you know we're definitely the largest. Christian community in the Carlton Place area. We were kind of broad and we had a lot of people in the door and it felt like it was humming, it felt like it was buzzing. But when the pandemic hit, and we didn't have any major drama, we didn't have like a church split, but we had, we just saw people drift. Uh, people drifted away from faith. We saw people, some people, because we, we, we tried to keep kind of a middle road in terms of uh, compliance, we had some people drift into sort of a high conservatism, uh, we're going to fight the government mode, and we had some people drift to uh, where we're, your church is just not complying with the restrictions as much as we would want to mode. You're starting the meetings too early. Uh, so we sort of had the, the far right and the far left kind of sort of sort of drift away, and, and, we, and we realized that, and this is not our church, but this is every church, but we realized what the pandemic did for us was completely restructured the church in North America, right? Which is insane when you think about it. Uh, like a virus, a medical challenge, restructured God's holy church. It's a sign that God's holy church needed some discipleship. And so uh, when we came through that, we realized that some of the things that were making us feel like we were part of the church and, and, and felt like attractive to people who were part of the church weren't necessarily big enough and, and, and clear enough and as close to gospel enough values that, that actually held people in relationship and held people together. Um, we would have conversation with somebody who would say, you know what, I, 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 I really love your church, but if you would just preach my particular view of the end times, then, then, we can, then I can really lock in and be a part of this. And I'm like, oh man, like we have a diversity of thought here. We have we have a group of people from different, all kinds of different perspectives. And so I'm not going to preach one view of eschatology as our view of eschatology, right? We're going to allow for diversity on matters that are a little bit less clear in the in the scriptures, right? So that there can be somebody here who has, you know, pre-trib and somebody here who's post you know, trip or amillennial or postmillennial or premillennial. We've got some of those things that are a bit mysterious in the scriptures. We've got diversity on that where we've got absolute unity, we hope, around the core of what Christianity is, as expressed in things like the Apostles' Creed. And so we realized that, that our values were chasing after all kinds of different things. And we needed to really be a church that would be gathered with, with more of a purpose to glorify Jesus. We were fundamentally, we felt like in some ways, uh, oriented towards coming to church to please ourselves, coming to church to uh, find uh, a familiarity of, of our values, a familiarity of, yeah, this place just feels like me, feels like home. And, and that's good. We want you to feel that. We want you to feel like your, your, you know, your church is home. But we, we also want it to be a place where the glory of God is more central and is more key to who we are, that, that we would come not for just the Sundays that please me and the Sundays that I agree with and the, the sermons that feel like, yeah, I really resonate with that one, but we would come, uh, and not for just worship that makes me feel the way I want it to feel, but we would want to be a people who would come together uh, simply because God has constituted a body and he is at the center of it and he wants to be glorified by it. So to recenter ourselves around the glory of God and so we've kind of re-articulated our values. Uh, we gather to glorify Jesus and be made like him so that through us his glory might be made known to the world. Uh, when we were uh, articulating our values before as a younger church, 
we were trying to be more attractive, trying to be kind of more hip, and now we're trying to be more lame. So that's... <laughs> No, we, we want to be understandable. We want to be contemporary. Uh, we, we want to use language that connects with our culture, but uh, we really want to be sort of uh, more deeply rooted, uh, not to gather uh, just because it's you know, like the more contemporary church in the region. And, you know, I used to recruit people to church and say, we have a drum kit, right? Can we, anybody done that? Like back in the day when churches first got drum kits, our church has drums. Now we don't even have drums, right? We're not cool at all. Um, and that's not what makes us want to be together, the style or the culture. We want to be together because of Jesus and who he is. So we gather to glorify Jesus and be made like him. So recognizing, one, he is central, and we want to glorify him. It's not about us as much as it's about him. Uh, we want uh, to be transformed, right? We're not here just looking to belong and looking to, to uh, have an experience that says, yeah, I resonate with this, I feel good about this, but we want to come into a place that challenges us, that calls us to be more like Jesus, that is going to confront you know, some of our values, that is actually going to confront our sin, is actually going to confront uh, the, the things about ourselves that God really wants to change. So we're coming in the door in humility and brokenness, saying, hey, Jesus, would you come and change us? Because we know that ultimately an attractional church, a church that is just a cool place to be, is not going to save the world. And it's not going to save the region, right? It's just, it's just not. Uh, we are going to change the world as we begin to look more and more like Jesus and people are attracted to him, Right? And so call for deeper discipleship. Instead of being a church that is a mile wide and an inch deep, uh, we want to be a church that is, you know, a mile deep. And, and if we have to be, you know, an inch wide to be a mile deep, then, then that, would be, that would be okay. We want to be more and more true to who he is. Uh, because we know that ultimately that's where success of being a missional church will be. Uh, if we're a safe alternative to a broken and shattered world, uh, people will come and they'll find Jesus and they'll, they'll find they love him. So when it comes to worship, uh, again, more Christ-centered, uh, probably less. Have you ever, we used to play a game in youth group. I don't think they played it in a while called Hillsong or Love Song. <laughs> right? So you can't tell whether that song is like a love song on pop radio or a Jesus song, right? We want to be you know, really Christ-centered in terms of our worship. We want to worship being gospel-shaped so that we're coming in and actually tracking with the gospel. That we're coming in and... Yeah, we're, we're sinners with messes in our lives. We come uh, to have Jesus uh, interact with us. We want him to reveal our sin to us. We want to have hearts of repentance. Uh, we want to accept the forgiveness and grace that he's poured out on us. Uh, we want to celebrate what he's done on the cross to achieve that. And we want to go forward in resurrection power to go out and reach our friends and care for them in the world, right? So that our service is gospel-shaped. It, it, it re-preaches to us the truth of what Jesus has done again and again and again and allows that to shape us. And then we want it to be just a relationally authentic encounter. We're not about putting on a show. I mean, if, if smoke machines will help that at some point, we will get the smoke machines. But I'm pretty sure that's not really what we're after, right? We want the presence of, and power of the Holy Spirit in the house so that when, when we're here, we know that God is manifestly present and we are interacting uh, with him, with his power, that he's speaking to our hearts. He's revealing himself to us. And we know that life isn't always like that. We don't always... Um, feel it and we're not always vibing it um, but he is here he is present he is real and we're worshiping him and we know he's touching hearts as we go uh, we think about the scriptures we're they're authoritative uh, they are how uh, are we doing well <laughs> they're how we judge uh, what is truth uh, we look to the Bible. Uh, we expect them to transform us. And, and just as a, there's a particular value in the vineyard and a value uh, for us is that we want to stick to the main and the plain. We want to stick to the core truths of Scripture and allow for diversity in matters that are less clear. Now, it takes time to get to know a community and build trust and to know what we feel like the core is and what other people feel like the core is. Like There's, there's discussion and conversation uh, there on all of those kinds of things, but uh, we're typically not going to get caught up in, in what the Bible calls foolish controversies, right? We're going to stick to uh, what, what is, is known, what is clear. 
um, in terms of discipleship, needful meaning we, we're coming into it saying, yeah, we actually need to be discipled. I, I am a person who knows Jesus, maybe I've known him for a long time, but I'm in need of being transformed. I see my own brokenness. In fact, that's one of the things that give us a sense of belonging in the church. One of the things we hold in common is that we're all messes, right? We, build, we can build unity around that one. Right? We're all people coming with that kind of uh, brokenness. By holistic, I mean, like, it, it, uh, discipleship needs to be cognitive Bible learning. We need to learn the truths of the scripture. It needs to be character formation. It needs to be developing our spiritual gifts. It needs to be uh, the whole package of uh, transforming us as people more and more into the likeness of Jesus. And that's mind, heart, soul, body. Um, so that's the whole deal. God wants to, to reach us, reach all of us. It needs to be intentional and purposeful. It absolutely has to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And discipleship really happens in community, right? We need people in our lives, iron sharpening iron, uh, deep relationships of trust where when we hit moments that are difficult, those teachable moments in which we can be discipled are, um, are, are, are known by the community and people can, can speak into our journey. We've been t talking about that for the last few weeks. Uh, our, in terms of another value, uh, Holy Spirit. We want to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Uh, we're a charismatic church. Uh, we don't necessarily look like it all the time, though. We are uh, not necessarily carrying the charismatic affectations or Pentecostal affectations, but we absolutely want the reality of the power of the Holy Spirit uh, moving in our lives, praying for the sick, uh, speaking the word of God to us, gifts active in the body, and, and functioning. And then know that ultimately, if that is authentic and that is grounded in the scriptures, it will be bearing. And what will show up in our lives is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Um, in terms of proclamation, uh, I think this is actually one of the weakest areas in the church in North America and one of the weakest areas that we have. Uh, is how many of you are real comfortable with evangelism? <laughs> Teresa is, that's right. Yeah, and she could also sell you a vacuum cleaner. She's <laughs> Teresa's fantastic. Um, but we, we need to grow in our ability to articulate the gospel humbly, thoughtfully, unapologetically. Like, I think there's a there's sort of a move, like, if I just am really nice to people, uh, they'll... They'll, uh, they'll, they'll ask me about Jesus and I can tell them. Or if I do good deeds, then, then maybe somebody will lean towards Jesus. And, and I absolutely believe that that demonstration of the gospel is critical. You've heard the famous saying, uh, St. Francis of Assisi, uh, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. And I would say preach the gospel at all times. It is absolutely necessary to use words. Uh, people have to understand the truths of the gospel and understand the story of what Jesus did in his uh, death, his burial, his resurrection. And so we have to tell that story unapologetically is the power of God and his salvation. Uh, we expected it to be relational. Uh, we're less going to, we're going to be less prone to choosing something that is programmatic, more choosing, uh, more prone to choosing something that is relational, that is personal evangelism, that is, has us deeply embedded, embedded in the lives of our friends. And of course, driven by compassion, right? Absolutely has to be driven by compassion. And then there's uh, the demonstration of the gospel. And again, this is an area where I think we're weak uh, in terms of, we, we do some things that are beautiful in terms of practically uh, serving people when they have needs. I think we've had, I don't know, I should have counted it up, but probably in the last you know, month, we've probably put out 25, 30 meals in terms of meal train and caring for people when they need food, things like that. Um, so there's practical things, there's a need for those in which we serve to be also evangelistic and relational. So if we're going to choose a way to do sort of a social justice thing, and I wish our church sort of had our thing that we said, yes, this is our cause, I, at least a part of me wishes we had that, we would choose something that is allowing us to create the space where we can also get into relationships with people and share the gospel rather than something that is just uh, purely uh, practical. We want it to be relational and absolutely um, compassionate. And then that last word there is supernatural, right? 
We believe that uh, God reaches people uh, when when miracles happen, when healing happens, when you meet somebody in the lineup somewhere at a grocery store. And I've experienced this. I'm sure others of you have experienced this, where the Lord drops a word in your heart that is something that is going to unlock something in their hearts and give you uh, a relational connection that will uh, will help reach that person. So we want the Holy Spirit flowing. Uh, we want the prophetic flowing. We want healing miracles. More and more and more of that as we as we go forward, uh, demonstrating God's love. So there's that. Um, what I have here, Anna, can you? I don't want to actually pass them out, but just oh, I have it right here actually. So what I have here actually is a, is a fresh articulation of our core values. Um, this is in draft form. This is something that our senior leadership has looked at. I'm going to make sure you guys have a copy of it when you go out the door because we want you to look at it as well and just have input on it. Have a look at it. Does, does this resonate with me? Does this make sense? This is kind of a fuller version where we've kind of tried to as carefully as possible articulate what we, what we think about this. But we want the whole community to just have a look and and give input and, and share your thoughts on it as we sort of craft something that can guide us a little bit more into the future. So uh, again, we want your input on that. Be sure to get one of those when we go. Uh, the next thing we want to do, everybody, this is just me talking a lot and talking fast. Everybody breathe for a second. In with the Holy Spirit. Out with the devil. In with the Holy Spirit. Out with the devil. Yeah. So yeah, we just got to breathe. Whew, we're going fast. Everybody hanging on? doing okay okay this is this is un unusual i promise you'll get a real sermon next week um so just introduce our leaders and can i just get members of our senior leadership team who are here to stand up it'd be anna and there's john is there warren and leanne simon kathy standing at the back brent is there as well and so these would be the people who would be people who would have sort of that you can get you guys can be seated who would have that sort of eldership function in the community. And th those roles are shifting a little bit. Um, in the past, we've even used language like senior leadership community because I, I felt like when we planted the church that we didn't really know what eldership was. We didn't really, um, like I didn't want us to just say, okay, we have in our constitution, let's put elders and let's just check the box and fill it with people who we think are, are elder-ish. We wanted to really own like a deep, deep sense of responsibility uh, coming from the scriptures and so we've been trying to grow in that and trying to learn and trying to lead but this is the core group of people that you can talk to and that I talk to that that really sort of uh, bring uh, the input of the community into conversation and care for the community in, in really practical and loving ways and again we make mistakes and we hope to really grow uh, as a team um, and we know that team also needs to be expanded. It's been really healthy and helpful over the pandemic for it to be quite a small and tight team because we've had to be so nimble. Uh, but as we're uh, able to be a little bit more stable, we can sort of expand that team a little bit. So we're thinking about how that can happen in days to come. But that's sort of our, our eldership component. Uh, you can talk to them about anything. There's high transparency uh, between us. Um, they will not talk about uh, any, each other or me behind their backs. Uh, they will they will telegraph what you say to them to each other, and we will talk about it, and we will we'll navigate um, how things go. Um, and then we have another uh, leadership, which would include the, our types, people that sort of lead uh, ministries in the community. And so could you guys stand up? There's Barry is at the back, um, and uh, where is... Uh, Kathleen is, is doing the, Barry just loves that. Yeah, Kathleen is doing um, the greeter team. Uh, I'm sort of overseeing the worship community temporarily until we find somebody who really wants to own that portfolio. Kathy does children and youth. She's part of our staff team. Um, and uh, I'm probably missing somebody. Uh, Seth and Aaron. Aaron does our communications. Uh, and she's, she's part of that team and manages media. Oh, there's the coffee team. There's Tanya. Tanya's here. Did you stand up, Tanya, or did I not? That's, yeah, it's your fault that I didn't notice you. <laughs> no, it's my fault, totally. Um, yeah, so, so Tanya manages that hospitality team. And so those are sort of our, our volunteer uh, team leaders, and we're just continuing to build into them and, and continuing to grow. But if you want to participate in ministry of the church, you can speak to any of them. And they, can, and they can direct you or any of us. And then there's our staff team. Uh, so Kathy stood up. She's waving at the back. Kathy does children, youth, and 
uh, sort of oversees a whole bunch of stuff that she wished she didn't have to oversee. Um, but she does a phenomenal job. Uh, we also have Erin, who works for us as a contractor. She's not here this morning, um, but she oversees the media team, and she does all of our graphics and communication and web. Uh, we also have Linda Sprunt, who is, is a contractor who works for the church, and she does um, all of our books and manages the finance side of things. So she doesn't uh, attend this church, but she's, she's on our team as well. And, of course, your trusty senior pastor is sitting in the hot seat today. So... Yeah, so that's that's sort of what our, our team of leaders looks like. And again, it's been a time, like, uh, with with all of the transition that we've navigated, we've been a tight team, and there hasn't been uh, a lot of change in that team. And it's been, it's been really healthy for us to be like that, so that we have very high trust navigating very dis- difficult decisions over a very short period of time. Like, you can imagine, you know, how hard it was to track with changes in uh, pandemic policy and restrictions and where are we going to meet and how are we going to meet and all of that and then navigating the complexities of the merger with with Calvary and so now as we sort of got our feet to the ground and things are a little bit more stable uh, we'll have an opportunity to sort of grow and develop that team our hope is to engage uh, some younger leaders Uh, we're all got a little bit of this in our in our beards which isn't isn't a bad thing Um, but uh, but we, we need to really develop the next generation of leadership in the church, and we're pretty passionate about that. Um, at the same time, wanting to actually take the qualifications for what it is to be a leader in the church and actually raise them. We want to actually grow as, grow as people, and so there's that uh, high sense of res- responsibility that comes along with that. Uh, in terms of our structure, um, we are, uh, this is, I don't know if some of you care about this kind of thing and some of you don't, uh, there are two ways of structuring a church in the province of Ontario and in Canada. One is uh, to be a uh, religious society, and the other is to be a not-for-profit corporation that's registered with uh, CRA, and so we're a not-for-profit corporation. So we have that structure, we have a board of governors, and uh, we're, we're structured that way, and that team relates uh, to uh, who we are to the government. Um, We have a couple of other sort of uh, resourcing organizational things alongside of us. Uh, We're a member of the Canadian Council for Christian Charities. Uh, We we have access to their resources. So when we're trying to figure out how to uh, do finances in a way that's really wise, that has sort of appropriate separation of duties to allow minimal uh, opportunity for there to be any kind of uh, uh, confusion in terms of how finances are handled, we consult with them. And, and philosophically, um, we're, we're basically, and this is sort of the way most churches have been planted in the last 20 years, is designed as that uh, corporate structure so that we can adequately communicate who we are in a way that the government understands who we are. So we have uh, the, our regular filings with the Charities Directorate, our regular filings uh, with the government of Ontario. And we all put on our sort of board hats. People put, I don't have a board hat, actually. Um, everybody else has a board hat. I'm, I'm, I'm the lowly servant underneath. Um, but everybody has their board hats, and, we, and they put on their board hats, and we go through sort of the details of what that meeting needs to be, and the minutes are recorded, and all of that stuff is, is dutifully done uh, so that we are in compliance with, with the government. And then uh, alongside of that, we want to be uh, an elder-led church. We want to be a church that is run... Uh, for the glory of God, uh, with Christ as our head, not the Canadian government, right? We want to be uh, an organization that uh, has as much autonomy from the government as possible so that we can be a spiritual entity that's led by Christ, yet at the same time compliant with all the good and safe regulations that the government has put over us. And so we respectfully uh, acknowledge governing authorities and and operate in that way, and then we remain as free as possible uh, to be a biblically founded and biblically led church uh, the rest of the time. So the SLT functions as that eldership community, and then when it's time to put the board hats on, uh, the board hats go on, and we we do that kind of a thing. In terms of understanding that structure, um, there's, a, there's a whole spectrum of ways that churches can be organized. And some of you will, um, and that because this is a young church, almost everybody who's been a Christian for a while will have been part of other churches. And so you'll, you'll be looking at our model, at what we are, and understanding it from the perspective that you're familiar with. 
a congregational model of governance, which is actually a relatively new model. Uh, I think the first sort of written description of a congregational uh, model of governance was about 60 um, and, and so that sort of form of governance where everybody in the church would have a membership and they would decide from among themselves uh, who their leaders are going to be and there would be sort of an annual uh, AGM where everybody has a vote and, and you know all those sort of things are happening. That's, that's a model that many of you would be familiar with. It's also called a Baptistic model. Um, and a model like that has uh, strengths and weaknesses like every model. Um, in the case of that, uh, what many people experience is that it's very uh, quite slow to make decisions, it's quite slow to navigate change, uh, and that it's quite challenging sometimes for leaders to come into that model uh, because uh, very often somebody who is, say, a pastor who comes into leadership with you know, his education and his experience and with a spiritual calling from God really doesn't have necessarily the authority that goes with uh, that calling that is on that person's life. And so that's a challenge in that model. And then on the other side, and I'm pointing, I should point over here, I realize I'm looking at it this way, stage left, stage right, so confusing. Um, so over here we have an apostolic model, and that would be a model that uh, others of you are familiar with. You'd be looking at a model where uh, there is, you know, a, a clear leadership hierarchy with somebody who is at the top, and that person gives a directive. Say that would be, say, the Roman Catholic Church, or there are actually, in particular, among charismatic churches, there are models where there's that kind of leadership where they've said, okay, this person is an apostolic leader. This person sort of goes up the mountain and hears from God and tells everybody sort of what to do. And that model has the the, the advantage that it is fairly fast moving. Uh, it is fairly uh, quick at making decisions since only one person is making the decisions. Um, and and But it's also a great weakness in that model, right? Because it's very, very possible and much more possible in that model for there to be a lot of spiritual abuse, right? Uh, for, for a leader to be one, get alone, uh, to be unaccountable, to be outside of relationship, and to get into a really unhealthy space. And so there are, there are churches that have that model. And so if you're coming and looking at our model, we're sort of something that is in between. If you're coming from a congregational model, we'd probably look to you like we are way high in terms of centralized control and not enough in terms of body input. And if you're coming from an apostolic model and looking at us, you're looking at it and saying, you guys are so slow. Where's the spiritual leadership? How are you guys hearing from God and making decisions? And what's your connection to your denomination? Right? And so what, we, what, what we're what we trying to do, and this is not just us inventing a new system. Uh, this is a model of leadership that uh, was kind of, I think, developed through quite of a, lot, a lot of discussion in the Vineyard Movement. Because the Vineyard Movement, starting in the 70s, uh, had this uh, opportunity where people were coming uh, out of Anglicanism and, you know, Roman Catholic churches and Pentecostal communities, yet brethren communities and Baptist communities and, and sort of more congregational things. And they said, oh man, we have an opportunity here as we uh, craft a kind of leadership structure to do something that kind of takes the best from these worlds and, and we hope will minimize uh, some of the downsides and hopefully arrive at a little bit of a healthier uh, uh, place with, without sort of the extremes. And so that's really what the vineyard is, is it's kind of a hybrid uh, model where it, where it takes this, this opportunity where, you know, the pastor can come and speak into the life of the community um, with, I'm not meaning to say anything, I, I hope I don't make you uncomfortable, but, um, you know, I come into leadership with um, a, a very, very high responsibility, um, a sense of a calling from God a sense that he, he spoke clearly to me and asked me to, to lead this church. We initiated it, we planted it, and I feel like I have to answer to God for how I preach and how I teach. Uh, you heard me last week when I spoke, you know, um, saying it would be better for me to have a millstone tied around my neck and have me thrown into the sea than for me to mislead someone in this body. And so I have the education, I have connection with the denomination. And so I come into the community with that sense of leadership and that responsibility. And so what this model does, it allows me to come in 
with that kind of voice and that kind of authority and, and to speak, but it also holds me highly accountable because my leaders aren't below me in any way, right? My, my board team in many ways can also, if necessary, stand above me and they can speak into my journey. Uh, they bring the wisdom of the congregation uh, to us as a leadership. Uh, we decide things together. I am not isolated. I am not alone. Uh, these guys know that I have cried my guts out in their presence at meetings, and I have put snot on the table in their presence. <laughs> and, and they put snot on the table in my presence. And they also have the authority to use the magic hook and, and fire me. They can decide to do that. They can decide you, you are not leading well. You need some time, and, and we're, you're gone. And the denomination also has that authority in our structure. So the denomination can say, your leadership is unhealthy. You are not leading as you ought to lead. So uh, you are out. I mean, there's no beheadings in the vineyard I, that I'm aware of. Uh, but but they, they do have authority to, to, to step in and, and move in a powerful way to protect you as a flock, to protect you as a body. So what we, we've tried to do is to create a, a place of mutual accountability where um, we have a very, very high value on relationship and transparency and connectivity that makes it possible for us to uh, have, a, have, we hope, a healthy uh, balance uh, in terms of how, how we lead. In terms of how we make our decisions together, apart from trying to be very, very prayerful, and trying to be, uh, you know, very biblical, and trying to, you know, balance things in alignment with our core values, balance things in alignment with the resources that we have access to. Um, I, I, if we look back at the story of navigating the pandemic, there's not a single decision that we can look to that we can say that Aaron made that decision. And there's not a single uh, decision that we can look back to and say. Um, that we didn't come to a place of consensus. So we have never had a vote <laughs> where we've said, you know what, there's uh, uh, this many of us that are in and the rest of us that aren't. We have come to a place of saying, let's come to the Lord together. Let's seek the Lord together. Let's listen to him together. Let's listen to the body together. And you'll be familiar with that through the, uh, through the pandemic uh, and through the the uh, time at Calvary, we would call a congregational meeting and we would call you guys up and ask you questions and you guys would give input on us um, so that we would really know what the will of the body is, know what the needs of the body are. Sometimes we have to make decisions that uh, people are uncomfortable with, that people uh, don't, don't like, but we navigate those things in relationship. Um, and the mechanism for input, we feel is, and this is something that John Wimber used to say about the vineyard, is your mechanism for input is much, much richer than an annual vote. Your mechanism for input is a phone call. <laughs> and if you think about how, like, this decision to make, to have this meeting, um, I, I was not thinking about having this meeting. Um, I, I, like, man, we are just stable. I can't wait to get to Christmas. And we're going to have a nice Christmas together as a church. We have to navigate no changes, no whatever. And Tom said, you know, like those meetings that we used to have uh, when we uh, were trying to navigate things in the, in the pandemic, or when we, were, sorry, we didn't have any meetings in the pandemic, we were trying to navigate things in the merger, we should just get together and we should do that again. So this wasn't even somebody on our leadership community that basically called this meeting. right? So that's the kind of input that we have. If, if, if the body has a good idea don't hold it back. We, we want to hear it. We take it to, as leaders. We discuss it. We discuss it with you. We consult with others. Sort of the more significant the decision, the broader the consultation. Um, and we, we do so much of this stuff uh, really relationally, really connected in that way. And what that creates is generates a, a great big pool of resource, a pool of input, a pool of insight uh, by which we, we guide ourselves. So the absolute critical uh, mechanism for us as a church is our dialogue, is our conversation, right? So, so we've, for the most part as a church, avoided 
you know, I, I've been in churches where, you know, there are like a congregational meeting, and I've literally seen a guy stand on his chair and say, stand with me, stand with me, and a guy over here, no, stand with me, stand with me. You know, we haven't had that kind of, that kind of conflict, that kind of challenge as a body, but we, for the most part, We've been able to navigate things relationally and organically. Not everybody has been happy with this church. Not everybody has loved the decisions that we've made. But uh, we, we, for the most part, feel like we've been able to come through most of our decisions and, and be able to say what it says out of Acts um, 15, uh, 28. Um, they're there at the Council of Jerusalem. They're trying to decide, you know, what kind of uh, guidance do we give to the Gentile church as it emerges in Asia? And they say, this seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. And so that's what we want to be as a leadership community, and that's what we want this church to be. When we make a major decision, when we try to decide how we're going to navigate or what we're going to do, we want to be able to say, this seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us. And to have really a high degree of consensus. And we made some really hard, really fast uh, decisions throughout the merger process. Uh, I came into that process uh, with what I brought as spiritual authority. Uh, with probably reading close to two or 3,000 pages of Pentecostal literature on baptism of the Holy Spirit. And baptism in tongue, or, or in the gift of tongues. And I came with uh, you know, a stack of commentaries in my office. Uh, I came with my degree, I came with my relationships with the vineyard and our discussion with them, and I brought that to the table, and then you guys brought your part to the table. You met with us at congregational meetings, you picked up the phone when we called, you called us when you were concerned, and we came out of that decision to not uh, pursue the merger um, and to come back into this place, basically being able to say, this is really, really hard, but this seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us. And, and so we, we hope that as we do this, as we build dialogue, and our structure will shift and change. We may do a membership thing at some point. We don't know. But as our, as our uh, dialogue continues, we, we just really trust that the Holy Spirit is in it. And so we really, really, like this does not work if you guys don't speak. This does not work if you guys don't pray. This does not work if you guys don't share your concerns and your ideas. This does not work if you don't read my emails. <laughs> so we, we try to do as much as we can to communicate proactively. Um, and, and probably not enough for some of you and probably too much for some of you. Um, but but as, as much as you guys can hear the heart of the, the community and we can hear your hearts, uh, we can navigate in a way that is, that is sort of a healthy middle road between that sort of strict congregational style of government and some sort of pope, some sort of popedom, which I wouldn't want anything to do with. So, uh, yeah, uh, that's that's sort of how we're at. Uh, in terms of our in terms of our finances, um, we sort of follow the principles laid out um, by the government of Canada. We take counsel, as I said before, from the Canadian Council of Christian Charities. Uh, we actually did a full audit in 2021. We just wanted to know how we were doing. Uh, there's a certain certain threshold for charities where, a, where an external audit is required, and we we're quite a bit under that, so we weren't required to do an audit, but we wanted to have one done, so we had to open up our books to an accounting uh, company, and they said, you guys are crazy, but we're happy to charge you around $4,000 for this. Um, but we, we really wanted uh, to know that we were doing well, um, or if we were doing well, or if we were doing anything wrong. And they, they gave us kind of a clean uh, bill of health and said that we're going above and beyond in terms of responsibility, um, you know, keeping separation of duties and the way that we sort of manage finances to keep everybody as uh, hands clean and to just keep everything uh, really healthy. So we've just, just tried to follow really, really good, good principles in terms of our financial governance. This is just a really quick snapshot of our finances. Uh, right now, everybody hanging on. You doing okay? We're close to the end. This is crazy. Everybody's like, I can smell the meatballs. Get me the heck out of here. This is so boring. Um, 
So, uh, yeah, so in terms of what we budgeted for the year, we're about 251000 And again, we're only partway through the year. Uh, what we'll do is we'll actually do, and it's something that we haven't done since before the pandemic, is we'll do like a proper, you know, financial meeting in the spring where we can, we'll put a copy of the, the documents in front of you and you can go through it line by line and we'll talk through all that stuff. But roughly budgeted about uh, twenty or $251,000 for the year. Um, in terms of... Um, we knew that the transition with Calvary, um, even if we stayed with them, was going to cost uh, something beyond what we felt like we could see in terms of revenue coming from the congregation. Um, at that time, we had a fairly substantial pot of savings. We had about $125,000 in the bank when we sort of began that process. So we knew that we would have to do things like set up new sound system, buy computers, uh, agree to a rental agreement with CPHS, uh, we did all kinds of things like play, paying for cleaners for Calvary. Uh, there was a little overlap in rent. We continued to pay them rent for a little while after we left as a blessing to them. Just other little things like that. We, we, we just knew that this transition would cost something. So we figured it cost about $24,000, again, for gear and expensive sound equipment and all of that kind of stuff. And we depleted our, our surplus uh, by that. Our, our giving year to date, is about uh, two hundred and ten thousand dollars that's as the end of october um, so that's right in line with kind of what we'd expected if we continue through at that uh, trajectory through uh, november and december we'll arrive roughly at that two hundred fifty one thousand dollar budget having uh, gone into our savings by uh, that twenty four thousand dollars so that's just a, a pretty rough guesstimate of what it will look like i think i think i put that forward to the congregation as a challenge uh, if you wanted to to give above and beyond and, and dream about helping us to, to pay all of those transition costs within this fiscal year. I think that would may be amazing for the body uh, to rise up and, and to help us do that. But we do keep these, uh, these savings on hand for transitions and challenging times like this. And so that's what those funds are for. And that's, uh, that's what we ended up doing with them. Um, the only thing to say to that is um, this place in the high school isn't secure. <laughs> we don't have a booking yet for Easter, right? So we are at the mercy of the board. It's a wonderful location, and we we do dream that someday the Lord would have a home for us that is is more secure and solid, and uh, uh, a ministry facility that would allow us to do a number of different things, in particular outreach programs that are really tricky to do without us having a, a physical space. And so, um, at the more resources we have, the more able we are to look at opportunities if they come. If we had an opportunity with a great lease space, having a bigger chunk of money in the bank that we could feel confident uh, to move with, that would be hugely helpful for us. Or if we saw, oh man, we, we really were burning out uh, our staff people, we really need to bring in another staff position to know that we have a, a pool of money in the bank that we can sort of take that risk and, and, and begin to do that is really helpful. So if you guys want to help us um, replenish uh, that uh, that fund that would be would be very helpful in terms of where the money goes you'll see just a very very simple chart and you can look at a breakdown in the spring um, but but we figure about 13 percent of our money goes to missions about 21 percent on ops and 65 percent on ministry but those are kind of almost not not quite and it's based out of lines in the budget but almost kind of arbitrary things so if you look at our ministry uh, that includes youth and elevate well 40 percent of the kids that come to yell elevate are completely unchurched kids so we could take what percentage of kathy's salary goes into running elevate and what percentage of the cookies and drinks and snacks and activities she buys and take 40 percent of that and we can bump that number over into that missions category and say that's actually missions you know or we could take you know something from ops and say well that's really actually really really directed to ministry um, and, and we could we could we could play with those lines a little bit, but I think in terms of getting a sense of where we're at, that's sort of how the funds are used and where they go. And if anybody wants to sit down and have a chat about uh, finance at some point, I'd be happy to have that that conversation. Um, we used to actually just post financials on the website monthly, so that there was a financial statement that was just up there every month, and we saw that the click click rate on it was precisely zero, so we just stopped. Uh, Doing, doing that work, but if anybody wants to see that uh, information, we're very transparent about it, and you can just ask. Uh, and then just in terms of where we're going from here, where are we going from here, guys? <laughs> anybody want to know where we're going? 
I sure do. Um, it, I think there's some things we know. Like, like I think if in a perfect world, sometime in the new year, uh, we'll sit down and we'll probably do maybe some kind of congregational retreat or we'll do some kind of a Saturday input session and we'll get somebody to help us facilitate and really begin to sort of clearly identify now that we're in a stable place, can we identify in a really, really clear way what our vision is? Uh, so that we can say, yeah, we, I, like I'm, I'm that guy. I would love to have a two-year, five-year plan. Uh, this whole following the Lord uh, through the wilderness thing is not quite how I'm wired. Um, so I mean, we need to really ask the Lord what he wants of us and, and pray and seek the Lord together. So that's going to be something important for us to do. But we do know, you know, what are roughly our, our problems, what our challenges are. Um, one, we need to do what we're doing now. We need to build cohesion, uh, have a common sense of identity, help people have a sense of ownership, uh, clarify our vision, our values, and we need to grow in commitment and consistency, right? That's a pretty obvious need for a church who's just come through a major transition. Uh, we need to take our existing leaders. Our existing leaders have been working really hard, and you should, like, you should be very, very thankful for these people who have met every second Thursday night for the most part. And we have wept together, and we have prayed together, and we have cried together, and we have struggled together, and we have made mistakes together, and we have fought together. These guys have 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 done yeoman's work. It is not a small. It is not an easy task. Um, but so we need to strengthen that team. We need to develop new leaders. We need to develop younger leaders. We need to expand and strengthen the next level of leadership in the community. Um, we need discipleship. That's really uh, clear. That's something we've been preaching about. Uh, we need volunteer engagement. Uh, so we need um, to to go deeper in terms of mission and service. We need to identify uh, how we're actually can say, yeah, we are very practically meeting needs in our community in alignment with the gospel, in alignment with our calling. Um, so that sort of mission, evangelism piece, uh, we need that volunteer engagement. We need more of you involved and serving. And then, of course, long, longer down the, the road, we would love to have a facility of some kind or have something that we know is more stable. And so those are just sort of the, the sort of obvious vision piece things that we're thinking about.